Welcome to Tennessee's At Home Learning Series for Literacy. Today's lesson is for all eighth grade students, although anyone's welcome to tune in. This lesson is the fifth in our series. My name is Mr. Ayers and I am an eighth grade ELA teacher in Tennessee schools. I'm so excited to be your teacher for this lesson. Welcome to my virtual classroom. Today's focus continues our look at narrative point of view, and we're first going to kind of jump back in to our work on characters in context. We're going to be finishing up our conversation about the ransom of Red Chief. And before we get started to participate in today's lesson, you're going to need something to write with, a surface to write on, two pieces of blank paper, and the chart that we started in lesson four. So at the beginning of, at the end of lesson four, we were looking at the character Bill, and I had just read a pretty lengthy chunk of text for you, and we wanted to go back and think about what was Bill feeling at this point in the story, and then what tells us that. Let's go ahead and take a look at what I had written down. So this time, I'm pretty sure that Bill is feeling defeated. Um, so, and how do I know that? Well, if you look at paragraph 71, you find out that Bill feels like he has sent the kid home. He knew that if he did not give up on the plan, the kid was going to drive him crazy or kill him. So now let's go in, let's continue it, the story, finish it up, and finish up our chart. Then you might turn around, says I, and have a look behind you. Bill turns and sees the boy and loses his complexion and sits down plump on the ground and begins to pluck aimlessly at grass and little sticks. For an hour, I was afraid for his mind. And then I told him that my scheme was to put the whole job through immediately and that we would get the ransom and be off with it by midnight if old Dorset fell in with our proposition. <sighs> so Bill braced up enough to give the kid a weak sort of smile and promised to play the Russian in a Japanese war with him as soon as he felt a little better. I had a scheme for collecting that ransom without danger of being caught by counterplots that ought to commend itself to professional kidnappers. The tree under which the answer was to be left and the money later on was close to the road fence with big bare fields on all sides. If a gang of constables should be watching for anyone to come for the note, they could see him a long way off crossing the fields or in the road. But no siree, at half past eight, I was up in that tree as well, hidden as a tree toad, waiting for the messenger to arrive. Exactly on time, a half-grown boy rides up the road on a bicycle, locates the pasteboard box at the foot of the fence post, slips a folded piece of paper into it, and pedals away back towards Summit. I waited for an hour that concluded the thing was square. I slid down the tree, got the note, slipped along the fence till I struck the woods and was back at the cave in another half an hour. I opened the note, got near the lantern, and read it to Bill. It was a written with a pen and a crabbed hand, and the sum and substance was this. Two desperate men. Gentlemen, I received your letter today by post in regard to the ransom you asked for the return of my son. I think you are a little high in your demands, and I hereby make you a counter proposition, which I am inclined to believe you will accept. You bring Johnny home and pay me $250 in cash, and I agree to take him off your hands. You had better come at night, for the neighbors believe he is lost, and I couldn't be responsible for what they would do to anybody they saw bringing him back. Very respectfully, Ebenezer Dorset. All right. 
So this time, let's fill in our chart for Ebenezer. Based on his letter, how do you think Ebenezer feels about the kidnapping of his boy? So if you look at the letter that Ebenezer wrote, I get the sense that there's almost relief that the kid is gone. My proof is this. It comes from the fact that the text basically says, keep him unless you want to pay me to take him back. All right, keep going with the story. Great pirates of Penzance, says I, of all the impudent. But I glanced at Bill and hesitated. He had the most appealing look in his eyes I ever saw on the face of a dumb or a talking brute. Sam, says he, what's $250 after all? We've got the money. One more night of this kid will send me to bed in Bedlam. Besides, being a thorough gentleman, I think Mr. Dorset is a spendthrift for making such a liberal offer. You ain't going to let the chance go, are you? Tell you the truth, Bill, says I. This little ooh lamb has somewhat got on my nerves, too. We'll take him home, pay the ransom, and make our getaway. We took him home that night. We got him to go by telling him that his father had bought a silver-mounted rifle and a pair of moccasins for him, and we were going to hunt bears the next day. It was just 12 o'clock when we knocked at Ebenezer's front door. Just at the moment when I should have been abstracting the $1,500 from the box under the tree, according to the original proposition, Bill was counting out $250 into Dorset's hand. When the kid found out we were going to leave him at home, he started up a howl like a calliope and fastened himself as tight as a leech to Bill's leg. His father peeled him away gradually like a porous plaster. How long can you hold him? asked Bill. I'm not as strong as I used to be, says old Dorset, but I think I can promise you 10 minutes. Enough, says Bill. In 10 minutes, I shall cross the central, southern, and middle western states and be legging it triply for the Canadian border. And as dark as it was, and as fat as Bill was, and as good a runner as I am, he was a good mile and a half out of Summit before I could catch up with him. All right. So let's write Bill on the next row. And how do you think Bill feels at the end of the story? Yeah, Bill is relieved and he's probably a little scared. My thoughts on that is that he's relieved because the kid is back home and Bill is rid of him. He's scared because he's afraid the kid might catch up with him. And the text says, Bill was running so fast, it took Sam a mile and a half to catch up with him. All right. So this is a great story. It has definitely has a twist to it that maybe we probably weren't expecting until we kind of got into it a little bit. I didn't really know who to think the Red Chief was going to be. So the cool thing is, is that we know the story from the point of view of the kidnappers. Now that we are aware how point of view can have an impact on our perspective, just think about it from the point of view if it changed to the kid's perspective. All right, so let's think about that for a minute. Before we get started with that, let's talk about paraphrasing. So paraphrasing is using your own words to express the meaning of a writer or speaker. The key here is that you're using your own words, but you probably already knew that. But do you know why we paraphrase? We, uh, we paraphrase to achieve greater clarity. In other words, if someone is having a hard time understanding the meaning in an author or speaker's words, we try to clarify the message by changing the words, but not the meaning. So I'll demonstrate how I think through this process. Let's look at this quotation. The boy is gone. I have sent him home. All is off. There was martyrs in old time, goes on Bill, that suffered death rather than give up. The particular graft they enjoyed. None of them ever was subjugated to such supernatural tortures as I have been. I've tried to be faithful to our articles of depredation, 
but there came a limit. So let me ask you some questions that might help you think about writing your own paraphrase of the quotation. So on your paper, I just want you to jot down your answers. So here are some questions based on the quote. Why did Bill send the boy home? The first two lines clearly show us that Bill has sent the boy home, but why? Let's paraphrase what Bill is saying here to make it clearer why he sent the boy home. Please make sure you pay attention to the lines that are in bold. They will help you find the answer. All right, number two, what is a martyr? So the first thing that I'm wondering here, what is a martyr? Remembering then that I have to make this passage clearer, I'm better first trying to figure out the definition of martyr in the context of this quotation. Read the first line in bold and try to craft a definition of a martyr. After reading this line, I know that a martyr would give up a lot, perhaps even their life for something that they believed in. All right, the next question. What does this show us about what the kid made Bill do? Now that I know what a martyr is and that Bill is comparing himself to one, then I'm thinking that Bill feels like it's been painful to keep the kid just so they can make some money off a ransom. And then our final question, what might Bill mean by saying there came a limit? So Bill says that none of them ever was subjugated to such supernatural tortures as I have been. How is Bill really comparing himself to that martyr. So if a martyr is willing to die for a cause, and Bill says that it's worse than even what they go through, then Bill is saying that he is subject of tortures that are worse than death. So what's the limit? He tried hard to go through with the plan, but he just couldn't take the torture anymore. So after answering all those questions, I'm going to give you a few minutes to paraphrase the quotation. Remember, it has to be in your own words and it has to be clearer to you and your reader than the original. All right, so take a minute to paraphrase using your notes and using the quote on your paper. All right, let's move on. Here's what I said. Remember that your paraphrase of the quotation doesn't have to exactly match mine. I wrote that Bill said 
There are examples of people in history who were willing to die for what they wanted, but none of them had to experience the amount of torture that I had to deal with from the kid. I tried to stick with the plan, but I just couldn't take it anymore. I just had to let the kid go. How does yours compare to mine? All right, next, let's talk about the point of view and perspective. Remember that our perspective is shaped by the point of view that the author decides to take or through whose eyes we are seeing the story. Oh, Henry chose to write the story through the eyes of one of the kidnappers. If you have your character chart that we created in the previous lesson and that we have started working on in this lesson, let's take a look at that. If you don't, that's okay. We'll work on it together. First, I want you to go back and I have boxed in red the emotions of all of our characters. Take a look and read through those words that we use to describe those emotions. What kinds of emotions would you say the kidnappers primarily have? We use words like scared, mad, scared, defeated, scared, defeated, relieved, scared. Do you think they're mostly negative or positive? Yeah, exactly. I would say they're mostly negative. Their emotions range from being totally scared to being frustrated. Now, let's look at the emotions of the kid and compare those to the kidnappers. Looking at the kid, what emotions do you see that he has? Is it positive or negative? Exactly. It's positive. He was having a great time. He acted as if he was camping with friends. With all that in mind, think about how your perspective of the experience was, by, was shaped by the point of view of the kidnappers. Would you say that it was a positive or negative experience for them? Yeah, most definitely negative. The interesting part, though, is we only think this because we saw it from the point of view of the kidnappers. Now, let's allow our perspective to be shaped by allowing the kid to be our narrator. How do you think that would change our perspective of the story? Jot a note down as to what you think the answer would be. If we change the story to, from, to go from the perspective of the kid, how do you think he would think of, how do you think he would describe the kidnapping? Awesome. The whole experience would seem a lot more fun, wouldn't it? So as we go through this unit, remember our conversation about point of view and perspective? We're going to revisit as we continue to read other great pieces of fiction and informational text. All right. So to end out the day today, I would like for you to take some time to think more deeply about what the story would be like if told from the point of view of the kid. As the kid, retell what happened to you in the story. Remember, you are trying to shape your reader's perspective based on the kid's point of view. You can use your character analysis sheet to help you. So there on your paper, on the back of your chart or on another sheet of paper, just retell the story. You don't have to do as in much detail. Maybe you're writing a letter to someone about your experience with these two guys camping out in the woods, but think of it as the kid is telling the story. How does that change the perspective? For the kidnappers, it was pretty negative. They did not have a good time. They did not get what they wanted. 
But for the kid, he really enjoyed it. He had a lot of fun hanging out with these guys and playing with them. And so the story would be told very differently. Just write out a short story based on the kid's perspective. I'm going to give you about six minutes to work on that, and then I'll come back with you.
All right, you've had about six minutes of work time. If you haven't finished, that's okay. You have plenty of time. You can work on that later if you want to. So keep thinking about the story and retelling the story from the perspective of the kid. Remember that as you go back and you work on your story and you make revisions that you're trying to shape your reader's perspective based on the kid's point of view. You can always refer back to your character analysis sheet to help you. Thank you so much. I have really enjoyed learning about point of view and perspectives with you today. Thank you for inviting me into your home. I look forward to seeing you in our next lesson in Tennessee's At Home Learning Series. Thanks a lot. Hope you enjoy the story. Goodbye.